this afternoon. We have an announcement from the Quebec government that there will be province-wide testing this afternoon beginning at 2.55. 2.55, there will be testing of the mobile network in the province and the LTE system may be affected so some of you, depending on your connection, you may have a loss of service for a while. We think it will be 10, 15 minutes, but we don't know. So we have been advised and we're communicating that uh, message to all of us this afternoon. Okay, so we move on to our next session, which is implementing the Global Security Plan. And to lead us into this session, we're very happy to invite to the lectern Mohammed Khalifa Rahma. He is the director of the ICAO Middle East Regional Office. Since taking over the position in 2016, he has been instrumental in strengthening regional and inter-regional collaboration in aviation security. His efforts focused on enhancing risk awareness and response, establishing a better defined security culture, promoting technologies while fostering new innovations, and improving oversight and quality assurance. At the same time, he continues to significantly increase cooperation among member states, global and local organizations. So Mohammed, it's a pleasure to have you here and we're looking for a terrific session. Thank you, Dini. Thank you, Dini. Excellencies, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, the Global Aviation Security Plan, GASIB, provides foundation for a global aviation security framework. ICAO regional offices, all the regional offices, in coordination with hosting states, have held a series of conferences after the GASIB was endorsed. And we were honored in the Middle East to kickstart this initiative by having the first aviation security conference for the GASIB. And this conference was held in the Sharm Sheikh city, Egypt, with the generous hospitality from the government of Egypt. Then other conferences was held in Bangkok for the Asia Pacific, in Portugal for the Euronat area, in Panama for North America, Central America, Caribbean, uh, uh, South America areas. After these conferences uh, and the drafting of the regional roadmaps, the tough part starts. Always the tough part is the implementation. During this session, our distinguished panelists will discuss observations, experiences, challenges, opinions during this very short implementation phase. Please, before we start, allow me to introduce my panelists for today, starting from my very first left, Mr. Mohammed Obaid Atayr, Chief Policy Specialist, Policy Regulation and Planning Department, Security Affairs, General Civil Aviation Authority of the United Arab Emirates. Mohammed joined the Civil Aviation Authority of United Arab Emirates in 2012 as an aviation security inspector and underwent a comprehensive international IKU IATA aviation security training program. Mohammed is current role is focused on further develop the CAA and the National Aviation Security Strategy objectives, policy, regulations, and programs, utilizing his field experience as well as his expertise in the UE federal government and international aviation security requirements. Our second panelist is Mr. Eduardo Gomez. And Mr. Eduardo Gomez is an aviation security advisor at the Directorate General of Civil Aviation of Chile. Mr. Gomez worked at the Directorate of Civil Aviation as Manager of Airport Services Section, Sub-Department Plan and Projects with over 41 years of professional experience in the AFSIC area. He's also an AFSIC expert of the North American and the Caribbean and South American Regional Group. He's also an experienced uh, IKO certified AFSIC instructor. He developed uh, and carried out important workshop with the title of Identification of the People with Suspicious Behavior for IKU LACAC region, Regional Group. Our third panelist, Mr. Wixiong Chen, DBT Executive Director, United Nations Counterterrorism 
Committee Executive Directorate. And this is not his first introduction. Mr. Chen was with us yesterday in the opening uh, uh, leaders plenary. Mr. Chen was appointed by the United Nations Secretary General as Commissioner of the United Nations Monitoring, Verification and Inspection Commission on Iraq WMB programs from 23, uh, 2003 to 2005. In 2004, he, is also, uh, he saw also served as Senior Advisor to His Excellency Mr. Kian Kishin, former Vice Prime Minister and member of the UN Secretary General High Level Panel on Threat, Challenges and Changes, which led to the foundation and the adoption of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy in 2006. Mr. Chen has also served as head of the UN counterterrorism delegations to many complex country uh, assessment visits and negotiated with member states on their capacity building needs. Our next panelist is Mr. Vladimir Chertok, Deputy Director, Federal Transport Oversight uh, Authority, Ministry of Transport, Russian Federation. Mr. Chertok is advisor of the head of the Federal Authority for uh, Transport Oversight, and currently he is in charge of state control and oversight for compliance of legislation and international treaties of the Russian Federation. His field covers the protection from acts of unlawful interference in all types of transport, aviation security, and flight safety in civil aviation. He has more than 30 years of experience at the State Research Institute of Civil Aviation and conducted ground and flight tests of board life support systems, survivals, and safety for crews and passengers, almost in all types of modern civil aircraft. Our next panelist, is our uh, gender equality icon, <laughs> uh, Captain Altia Bartley, uh, Manager for Aviation Security and Facilitation, Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority. Captain Bartley is an experienced subject matter expert in aviation, aviation security and delivers training on behalf of ICAO within the North America and the Caribbean region. Captain Bartley currently represents Jamaica at the ICAO LACAC Regional Group on Aviation Security. Not only this, but she is the current Vice Chairperson as well. She was the Chairperson of the UN ODC, Airport Communication Program Steering Committee, that had led to the implementation of the joint introduction. Uh, Captain Bartley ha has worked with organizations Ameri in America's states over the years to identify technical experts and to deliver aviation security training in the region. Her working paper on rethinking cybersecurity, aviation security, was presented to the Regional Cyber Security Conference in Bogota in 2016. Last but not least, Mr. Nathaniel De, AFSIC uh, Training Manager, Ghana Airport Company Limited from Ghana. He holds this position for more than 11 years. Mr. De is an AFSIC BM graduate and has over 21, experience, 21 years of experience in AFSIC. Uh, being uh, both an IQ certified instructor and USAP auditor as well. Mr. Day holds an MBA in human resources with, with application on the civil aviation uh, sector as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to get your devices ready before we have this <laughs> communication cut at 2.25 and try to uh, answer uh, as fast as you can, the uh, polling questions, and as well as sending questions directly to the audience. Let's uh, kick off, Christy, maybe by putting the first uh, polling questions on the stage. Yeah, so we have uh, this question, and I want to play something for you. Maybe it will encourage you to, uh, to answer this question. Who wants to be a millionaire? Wow. Only six people want to be a millionaire. This is not a good sign. <laughs> so the questions, I'm reading it for the interpreters. Which gossip key priority outcomes is the most challenging in the implementation? And uh, we have uh, the answers ready for you. You just choose one of them. A, enhance risk awareness and response. 
B, develop security culture and human capabilities. C, improve technological resources and foster innovation. D, improve oversight and quality assurance. And E, increase cooperation and support. Please uh, try to answer these uh, questions to choose one of the answers. We will leave it for a while, Christy, and then I will turn to my panel. And the first question is for Mr. Altair. And from a state perspective, Mohammed, we need to know from you how you ensure that the GASIP roadmaps are disseminated among all stakeholders on the state level, and how we ensure that they understand it and they are working on the implementation of this roadmap. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. First of all, uh, uh, it's good to say my name out loud. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll just uh, take a few seconds to uh, uh, compliment IKO and uh, everyone who organized this event for this uh, 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 really successful uh, uh, symposium. Uh, and I'm honored to be here. Uh, in the UAE, uh, we do that through the National Civil Aviation Security and Facilitation Committee. Its main role is to advise the government and the GCA on all matters relating to civil aviation security, ensuring a balanced approach between aviation security and facilitation uh, in the United Arab Emirates. In addition, we have a uh, technical uh, uh, civil aviation security and facilitation committee that meets regularly. Uh, this committee is composed of all relevant aviation security stakeholders uh, and the main functions of the Technical Civil Aviation Security Facilitation Committee are to uh, advise the National Civil Aviation Security Facilitation Committee on aviation security measures necessary to meet the threats uh, of unlawful uh, interference uh, to civil aviation and keep the implementation of such measures under constant review and make recommendations for change to these measures in response to new uh, threat information. Ensure coordination of aviation security and facilitation among departments, agencies, and other organizations responsible for the implementation of the National Civil Aviation Security Program. Uh, ensure promotion of security uh, in the design and facilitation of new airports for, uh, for the expansion uh, of existing facilities. And uh, also, in addition to many others, uh, uh, implement any in instructions that may be issued uh, by the National Civil Aviation Security and Facilitation Committee to Civil Aviation Security and Facilitation. Uh, the GASAP uh, objectives are presented in these committees, along with the gap analysis with the intent to, uh, to decide on a five-year uh, strategic plan uh, for the GCA Aviation Security Affairs. And uh, it was decided to further focus on uh, technological resources and to foster innovation as well as to enhance uh, security culture and human resources. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. I can see two words coming from your uh, answer. One is flexibility to changes, which is very important, is that you have the flexibility to cope with the new risks and changes. And the other is the committee work, which is uh, best to be a national committee where all stakeholders sit together and discuss things so they can speak the same language and will be on the same page in discussion. Uh, I'll move to my second question to Mr. Chin, Mr. C, if you allow me. Uh, the question is related, of course, to the counterterrorism activities. How is the GASIP interlinked with the global counterterrorism activities? And how do you align your activities to the GASIP priorities in the context of aviation security? And what are the challenges in these activities? I thank the Mohammed. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. So, colleagues, Mr. C is back to the stage after the commercials <laughs> over the past two, uh, I think, days. Uh, okay. Now, to, to set the scene uh, easily, uh, in the United Nations, in New York, we see counterterrorism uh, basically into two areas, the soft area and the hard area. By soft area, we say that it's preventing or countering violent extremism. Now, definitely for the hard area, it's about the border management. And aviation security definitely uh, is one of the uh, integral and important part of it. And in particular, when you talk about the, the three-dimensional physical border control uh, in air, at sea, on land, I think the, 
So, and the second point, uh, which I would like to say, uh, is that the, I will continue to use some harm, but I will continue to use the, uh, the English letter C uh, in order for you to summarize Good. them. The first C is that the, uh, the resolution uh, 2309, in fact, is a certification. It has certified that the ICAO and CTED, we are cousins. We are cousins within this family of the UN uh, to address the counterterrorism and also aviation security. That's the first C. The second C is by another resolution last December, uh, is the resolution of the Security Council in the UN uh, 2396. It concerns uh, about the introduction and implementation of API and PNR. By that resolution, the Council reaffirms that ICAO and CTED, we have the role of complementarity. So that's the second word. We recognize ICAO is a leading body uh, in implementing the GASEP. And in fact, the resolution welcomes the introduction of GASEP. While in the Council in New York, we will have our leverage. We have the political impetus. So we work with you in that regard. The third one is that the, for my office seated in, the, in New York, we have our strengths in uh, country assessment. I think the, my colleague from Jamaica may also be able to, to, ex, to, to share her experience when we visited Jamaica. Uh, we had the, uh, also the analysis of the country profiles, which also uh, includes uh, aviation security. And third, we have the expertise. So we work with ICAO, we have the role of the catalyst. So that's the third C. So we work with you, we work with you within your time span with the same speed and tempo on the implementation of GASAP. The five pillars, one way or the other, have relevance in our mandate. Now, the fourth one is the continuation. I think the, today we've been talking about the walk, as we say in New York. But more important from now on, GASEP, which is on our table, we should be walking about the talk. So I think the, we have a lot to do. And I'm glad that the, I would like to draw your attention to the, uh, the logo here, the yeah. need to know. But from today on, we should change it for the next session, the need to do. And perhaps the third session is the need to complete. As that's the way we have to set our uh, mid-term and long-term goal within the time span. Uh, Mohammed, I will conclude because it will be the last session uh, uh, for us here. So we hope that the, what we need to do is not to reinvent the wheel. What we need to do is to fix the flat tire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. C. You can see that Mr. C has given us a lot of C's. And uh, yeah, I like uh, the most the issue of catalyst because this is a responsibility for all the organization is to try to play the role of the catalyst in order to enhance aviation security. We are all involved, we are all accountable and we are all responsible. I also like the issue of continuation because sometimes we come up with brilliant ideas but these brilliant ideas die by time. So we need to continue persistently in our efforts to enhance the aviation security around the globe. I guess we've reached the mark of 90 responses to the questions and I would leave it. I need to break the mark of 100, please. So uh, anybody who is interested to be the number 100 who answers the question. <laughs> I, I can do it myself, we still, we, we still have time. To our gender equality icon, Altia, and Altia is coming from a small country, and we had the discussion yesterday and today, is that when it comes to implementation, the situations in the states are different. Needs are different, priorities are different. So probably we are now thinking about a regional roadmap. We might need to think also about national roadmaps for each state that suits the uh, situations in each state. So my question to you, uh, Captain Partley, is what is the fundamental challenges faced when implementing the five key priorities uh, at the regional level and what effects do you have on your own state or 
uh, any other small state uh, as your country. Okay. Can you hear me? Good. Um, thanks for the question, um, Mohammed. I'll, I'll tell you what I told him. I thought you were setting me up because I asked him, you really want to ask me about my challenges? Um, I represent the Narkarsam region, the North American Caribbean region. We are 21 states, 19 territories. 80% of us are small island states. So when it comes to challenges, you're looking at um, resources, first of all. We are normally what we call a one-man shop. So we're, we're the inspector, we are the regulator, we're the one that's writing the policy. So when it comes to dealing with um, a GASEP, we have to start to look, how is this going to fit in to my current workload? Because it can't be something that I'm going to add. I have to work smart and I have to work effectively. So first of us, um, our regional GASEP only was finalized in July, which means that it is still pretty new to majority of the states, and I can probably say about 50% still haven't read it yet, even though we have some deadlines for 2019, 2020. So that's one of the, the challenge. Yeah. Um, the next challenge is how do we deal with risk? And for anybody who has been to vacation to any of our islands in the Caribbean, you can understand that you don't think of an island as regards to a terrorist risk. You're there to have sun, sand, and sea, correct? So how do you get the islands and the ministers and the politicians to realize that, listen, island states can be a risk and threat too? So for us, we have to be smart. We normally have other problems. We have narcotics. We have human trafficking. And so we have to twin the threat to terrorism with the other threats that we have locally and the impact that it will have. Uh, one of the challenges we have as well is identifying the threat and, and sharing of information. That has been repeated throughout the um, couple days that we have been here. And I can give you an example. So, this is a real example. Um, as a state, we have a narcotic problem. And uh, we have screened our, we screen all the bags 100%. Um, however, a bag gets on board the aircraft and goes to state B. State B finds that there's narcotics in the hold of the aircraft, which means that somebody has put it there. Yes. It, has not, it has bypassed the security system. But State B does not come back and provide me, the original state, with the information mm. which I need to help in my analysis of the threat. So we'll talk about sharing of information. So we need to do that a little bit better. Um, we talk about, already talked about the security culture and the issue that that has. And the main one in terms of one of the fundamental is technology and innovation. You know, us poor island states, we don't have no research and development department at all. So when you're asking me now to deal with testing of equipment, I'm not going to be able to meet that 2019 goal and objective that is in my regional plan. Yes. So I'm going to have a challenge there. Right? But what we do do well, and I will tell you that, is that we do cooperate well. So we do have um, technical capacity, and we work well with each other. We work within the region. We provide technical assistance and peer assistance, and that is what we have built on. I think Oscar talked about it before. So within the Narkarsam region, we do a lot of that, and so for that, we work very well. So I hope that answers my challenges. Thank you, Captain. I, I can see the challenges very clearly, but I liked your sentence when you say that we need to twin the threat. Sometimes, yeah, it's not a threat until we combine it with other issues. So if there is any gap in one of the issues, it might lead to another gap in our aviation security system. So thank you very much. I also, we will talk about the timelines. Some timelines are really very challenging to your country and even to country in my region as well. Timelines are really very short for some of the countries, putting in mind the available resources, the legislations, the setup of the uh, aviation security apparatus in the states. So we need to rethink about these timelines. Maybe uh, we need to have another look and a thorough look of, of, of this issue. Thank you very much, Captain Bartley. And then I move the question to Mr. Chertuk. And before that, we are at, 90, at 98. Two guys, please. Two volunteers. 98 respondents. And you know what? You have put your efforts in the polling questions, and you forget to ask questions to the audience, which is not fair. So we need also some questions to the panelists as well. Uh, Mr. Chertuk, 
Um, if we can put the result of the polling questions, Christy, please. Yeah, it will, will come up in a second, yes. So you can see clearly that the biggest challenge is the culture issue, security culture issue. Uh, more than 44% of the respondents say that the, the security culture is the issue. And by this, I will direct the question related to this issue to Mr. Chertuk. And also yesterday, we have a very interesting uh, session about security culture. So, Mr. Jertuk, how, in developing the aviation security culture in your state, which is one of the key uh, priorities of the GASET, which initiatives you have implemented at the state level to develop the aviation security culture across the system? And what were the challenges to uh, implement these initiatives? Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for this very important question. First of all, I would like to ask Mr. Chen uh, in, um, because his name starts with C and so does mine, his last name. I'd like to include him. So coming back to the uh, question of a security culture, I would like to say to start off that for the Russian Federation, this is also a very important issue. Well, why? Russia is an enormous country. We have the sun somewhere all day. When it's uh, going up in one side of the country, uh, then it goes down on the other side. We have 166 different ethnicities. And we understand that we need to have an integral, comprehensive culture of security, and it needs to be understood for all of these different peoples. We have already uh, taken part in the last five uh, sessions that were dedicated to these key specific are areas of the global plan. But I would like to note that each of these key priority areas, and I'd like to repeat them. This is enhancing risk awareness and the security culture and technology and innovation, and also the improved oversight and quality assurance, increasing capacity, capacity building. In all of these, you have the human factor. And we understand that this means that we need to work very hard on establishing a security culture. I would also like to note that in our panel session, we are looking at all of these five areas as a package. But coming back to the security culture, it seems to me that the terminology itself and the approach already contain a proactive approach. And they're working towards uh, early warning and prevention of uh, violations of security requirements. And if we understand that the security cu culture should be present everywhere, this is a new uh, and very specific standard for our Annex 17. And so, of course, this is also for uh, the, the completion of our security manuals. But the basis of the security culture in Russia, of course, this means working with people. I really liked what Mr. Kotko said at the first session when he said that the weak link is people. 
and they are a critical element. And so we are working in four different areas. And the security culture applies to the fo following things. The first is the security culture um, among the security staff. The second is ensuring that the leaders have a security culture. The third is a security culture among the passengers. And the fourth aspect is having a security culture in the population of the country. So briefly, what are we doing to establish a security culture among the personnel? Of course, this means training and motivation. We have introduced uh, a system of video monitoring at all facilities. And this is a control system that monitors the staff work, and this is quite efficient. Of course, we are working on cybersecurity threats. And the most important thing here is that we are trying to explain to the personnel that they have a very important social function. Their role is to protect the life and health of people. And this is the most important role that is played at the airport and at the airline. We have thought up a system in terms of how can we implement it. So for example, in our Russian University for Transport, we have opened, uh, we have uh, inaugurated a special monument to the transport workers who have perished in fulfilling their duties. Unfortunately, this has occurred in our history, and we would like all of the staff to know that their work will always be noted and that we will remember them. We have in institute a special system for also rewarding staff who have worked for a long time. As regards the leadership, all of the governors of the various entities of the Russian Federation are leaders in their regions. And they are part of the legislative body. And we give examples. We expect these leaders to be examples, uh, personal examples, in uh, looking at this culture and its implementation. So of course, it's very important for us to be implementing the ICAO manuals and uh, looking at the publication of and having a public discussion of the results of audits. Here, the, the leadership needs to know the auditors and the business community need to know, and we need to all look in detail at any violations and uh, take the appropriate measures to resolve them. As regards passengers and the security culture, here, first and foremost, it is teaching them about the rules of security, which are in principle, written everywhere around them. But if you ask any individual passenger what the requirements are of that passenger, I think the majority of them don't know. We even uh, have a special competition among our uh, students at uh, the higher education institutions in this area and w about whether or not they know the rules and so, of course, it's very important for passengers to know. And so we are 
teaching them, and of course, they will be responsible for any violations of these rules. This is also very important. Unfortunately, the passengers don't know uh, what kind of sanctions may be applied uh, if they violate these rules. And the fourth group is the population. We are working very hard with the mass media. We are in in the media, on TV, in newspapers, and the main thing that we are trying to do is to explain to everyone this n new image of the person who works in the security system, especially at the airport, that this is a defender. This is not someone who is going to bother the passenger or be an obstacle to them. This is rather someone who protects them, their life and their health. And so, creating such a new uh, vision of the employees in the security system is also very important for creating a security culture. We are uh, going to celebrate a very important day for us. It was uh, decreed by the president to the 3rd of December. It's a day of solidarity in the combat against terrorism. We will have open uh, lessons in all of the institutes of higher education. This is uh, our people, people who fly, people who can also come and help in emergencies. And they can come and tell our students how they need to act in such situations. I noted with great interest uh, what was happening in such events. I also wanted to mention another thing, which is that uh, involving the mass media has the greatest effect. And finally, I would like to say that in Russia, uh, the year of two, 2018 is the year of security culture. We are doing many, uh, conducting many events that is, are dedicated to this topic. Thank you. It's nice to hear that uh, there is a year called the year of uh, security <laughs> culture somewhere in the world. It's very interesting. I have also taken another note of another C, which is communication. I like the word working with people because sometimes notes and bulletins and letters, they will not address the message right to all the people. So communication with people is really an issue to improve the uh, security culture. Now I move to last but not least for our panelist is Mr. De. And my question to Mr. De, uh, we still have Mr. Eduardo as well. We have a question for him. But for Mr. De, my question is, how does the state ensure the implementation of the regional roadmap? Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for the question. Uh, my approach to this question is actually, uh, I would take the form of suggestion than being uh, rigid. Uh, the first item that may be considered on this is governments and states to demonstrate the will. That is very important. To demonstrate the will, show interest, and be committed to put the roadmap into action. Uh, until that is done, it's going to be very difficult for those on the ground to start the implementation process itself. Uh, having crossed this header by showing this commitment, then it's also important for the state and local authorities to realign their national security programs with the gossip. That is another thing that I considered that should be done. Uh, aligning the national program with the GASEP actually starts the implementation process. The next is those, it is not only the state and authority that is going to do this, but what about those on the ground, the other operators like the airport, the airlines, and others? 
as to whether they have access to this information or not is another issue. So it is also important states organize seminars or forums to discuss the issues regarding the gossip and narrow it to the roadmap. Create the awareness. Those who will be implementing the roadmap, are they aware of the existence of the gossip? So such forums is where I expect this awareness to be created, highlights the objectives of the gossip, as well as the five key priorities that we'll be looking at. Now, in addition to that, it is also important that the stakeholders are brought to speed to understand or be aware of the global targets. What are the global targets? They also need to know the 32 actions under the key priorities as well as the 94 tax to be implemented. Now, once the stakeholders are educated on these objectives, the actions, and the priorities, then it should be now narrowed to the regional roadmaps that is in place for the implementation of the gossip. Now, in addition to this, as to whether the stakeholders who will also be part of the implementation have access to the plan is or remain another question. Again, I suggest these plans or copies of these plans should be made and distributed to the stakeholders. Organizing a forum, talking about the targets, Talking about the actions, the priorities alone is not enough. They need to have access to the copies of these documents. Uh, where it is necessary, the European authorities may establish units within the ASEC department. And these units could be assigned with that role of coordinating the implementation of the roadmap. Provided these units or their activities may not duplicate what the ASAC department is already doing. Stakeholders could also be advised to emulate same. Uh, for instance, when it comes to the issue of the airport, there may be a unit or the quality control, internal quality control unit could be assigned this role as well to champion the implementation of the roadmap at the airport level. Some of these things, when they are doing it, it's also important for them to be uh, informed about the timelines. It is not just telling them what they are to do, but the entire lines as outlined in the various or in the roadmaps must be made known to them. Uh, the stakeholders must also be encouraged by the Republic State authorities to make their challenges known to them so that where necessary, they will be actually assisted. Maybe in certain programs like training and capacity building, and uh, perhaps advise them on new technologies and innovations to be used. How you put all these things in place? As to whether the process itself is being implemented or not is another issue. So at this point, it is important for the state of authorities to actually intensify their oversight activities to monitor the level of implementation of the roadmap and 
where necessary, suggest or review the actions they intend to take in the implementation level. Uh, the oversight activities might not be just one thing, but it must be a continuous process so that whenever there's a need for their internal actions to be reviewed could be done. But then it is possible to say today that there are other stakeholders like the airlines, the ground handlers, the airports who implement various aspects of the security program do not have access to this document. If they do not, how then do we expect them to play their part? So it is very important that the appropriate authorities take the lead, bring up to speed what they need to know, and assist them in the implementation process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dare. Also, again, I, I can see uh, talking about people, about <clears throat> spreading awareness, and about um, when, you, when it comes to implementation, we need more awareness from the people. And uh, even Mr. Dare suggested that we have a special unit for implementation of the GASIB inside the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, if I want to go back to the second polling questions, and I can tell you, Christy, that without music, we have only 30 participants. So the message is give incentive to people to, en to enhance aviation security. Even a simple, simple incentive will make a change. Uh, as you can see, again, speaking about human resources, eight, almost 76% of the respondents say that the biggest challenge uh, or constraint for implementation is human resources. So we are on the same page on this. Uh, human resources need uh, great attention from all, all of us in order to make the difference. Uh, going to Mr. Gomez, and my question to him is really a broad question. So if you bear with me, is if we need to do version 2.0 of the GASIP, what we need to change, what we need to enhance, what we need to add to this uh, plan in order to be uh, uh, more appropriate for the states to implement. Thank you very much, moderator. I'd like to thank you. I would also like to thank ICAO for allowing me to share my experience with you. Having analyzed the GASAP, which is a tool that will be difficult to implement, I think that we need to establish facilitation activities because we need to improve the passenger experience. Unfortunately, there are more and more passengers and we have to keep up with the increase in volume. So we need to find a good formula so that we can harmonize all of the activities that need to be implemented in both facilitation and security. Also, risk management is very important. This can make the difference, and it's an important element that we have to keep in mind. But this is a challenge to be able to uh, implement all of these measures without uh, being detrimental to the passenger experience. In our group, we worked on the implementation of a regional plan. And our suggestion would be to keep in mind facilitation. This is because it's also important. We, we, well, we often talk about security and less about facilitation, but we need to have both and to harmonize them. We also 
need to implement Annex 17, and in order to do that, we have to have the necessary information. We need to take into consideration the basic elements. The passenger needs to be treated well, and all of the procedures need to flow and go quickly. But of course, this is difficult. We have said that there are five key gas up priority areas. This, this might be another incentive for you to, uh, this is emergency. Huh? Uh, but we have got uh, 60 respond now to the polling questions before the cutoff. Is this is this just a uh, drill, <laughs> Mr. Cerdo says? Your phone is not from me, but there is a message from your phone. You have to uh, switch it off, switch off the mobile and switch it on again. It's quite a good exercise. Huh? But it says? Uh, yeah. It's a Quebec alert system. Yeah. Continue? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So I'll continue with what I was saying. There's another important concept, namely coordination. We have to coordinate the implementation of this global plan with the other services so that we can work in harmony to ensure that all of the activities are coordinated. Here I mean the police services, um, health services. We need to implement the GESEP while also ensuring good facilitation. And so this is the vision that we have to have. On the one hand, there's security, which of course needs to be ensured. But we also need to make sure that we maintain facilitation. And this is what I mentioned in the beginning, and this is an important concept. This global plan is a challenge. There are opportunities to improve on the tasks that are done every day at, in the airport and at the state level. We can enhance capacity and training, but all of this is in order to give the best service possible to the passenger. It, and I think that is what is important in the implementation of the gas up. C is coordination of all the services and harmoniz better harmonization between aviation security and facilitation. Um, and this is a challenge in, in the light of the expected growth of uh, the sector, the expected growth of the passengers. It will be a real challenge how we harmonize both activities of uh, aviation security and facilitation in one area, in one airport. This is really a challenge. Uh, as we I think we can, we can move now to some of the questions that is coming from the floor, and I can see an interesting question that is questioning the work done by the states on IQ, saying that uh, this is the last question in the row. Can the implementation of the GASIP be done only by setting the five priorities? This is quite an interesting question. And, uh, I want to give the floor to any of the panelists who are interested to answer. Uh, if not, I can choose, or what? <laughs> the question says that, uh, can the implementation of the GASIP be done only with five priorities? Uh, I mean, there are other issues that might not be covered by uh, uh, these priorities, and I think, uh, Captain Bartley has said some of the other issues that uh, uh, might be, uh, has the same effect if we have a gap in some area that could cover. Uh, so Captain Bartley, if you can comment on that. 
our gender icon. Okay then. <laughs> yeah. It's not free of charge to be a gender icon. <laughs> Um, as regards to the five priorities, um, Gasup, it's I would say it's narrow, and the problems that we have um, to meet the, the goal line. Because remember, there are actually targets set as regards to the effective implementation of based on the USAP CAB. So remember, that's the first um, measurable outcome that we do have, which goes all the way up to. Um, we have 2020, I believe, is one of the first goals as to where we're going to be going up to 2030. Now, the five priorities that are based on the GASIP are not in the USAP. They're not, um, they're not standards. These are nice to have, not need to have. They're, it is hoped that those five, five priorities will augment or will improve the USAP um, CMA approach. Um, but the problem is the USAP CMA in itself has limitations. Um, it is static in terms that you get audited in one year and you're finding it there. And even if you do a corrective action plan, you may not see that globally turn up as an, as an improvement until three to four years later. So that is one of the challenges, because it, it, it is not a really continuous monitoring approach as we would like to think. It's mm -hmm. still very much a three to four year cycle mm -hmm. as regards to um, states. So we'll see what happens in 2020, and to see, what, and I guess the audit department is, is under stress mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody gets up to date um, yeah. reports by 2020. Thank you, it's a good insight how we incorporate these five priorities into the continuous monitoring approach that we're doing. It's a real challenge, and it's a good, uh, good insight from you, Captain Bartley. Uh, also, I want to pick another question from the screen, and the question says that how do we fully incorporate and synergize cybersecurity into the GASIP? Uh, cybersecurity is an emerging issue, and everybody is talking about it. Um, uh, in some regions of the world, we are still in the learning phase, but. Uh, uh, this will be an issue in the coming uh, five to ten years. It, it will be a serious issue. So, how can we incorporate? Uh, how can we better incorporate uh, this cybersecurity issue into the GASIP? What resources are needed? What we can do as ICAO? Uh, do we need to add some more priorities? Uh, do we need to do more actions under the priorities? Uh, what do you think is the better way to go forward? Any of the panelists would like to respond? Mr. Chen, maybe. With another C. Uh, thank you, uh, Sukran Mohammed. Uh, yes, cyber. That's another C. Yeah. Uh, you know the this cyber uh, risk and threat is new, and it has caught the attention of everywhere. In this forum, regional forums, as you mentioned, Mohammed, the regional documents already highlighted that risk and threat, and in the United Nations. The third point is that the, to be aware about the risk and threat is not enough. This is one of the most sophisticated area that I don't think that the audience here can fix it. So what are we going to do? So the problem is the how. How to deal with it? There may be two areas we have to think about it. First of all, uh, in general terms, a jurisdiction should try its best to ensure that the everybody has the freedom to express themselves and also the free access to information. But the other side of the coin is that we have to also take preventive measures to prevent the misuse of the cyberspace are uh, by terrorists and their affiliates against the civil aircraft, against the soft targets, against the airports, and also the system. So I think we have to bear in mind these two. It involves a lot of work. And now I come to the second point, which is very critical uh, in the gas app. Now when you talk about the physical protection, training, expertise, this is one of the difficult ones. I can tell you one story in my office. We're using the word, the Microsoft, 
But when, some when something happens wrong in my computer, I don't know how to fix it. So just imagine this cyber capacity. You need a well-trained professional team to handle it. You need equipment. You need uh, also the facilities. You need also the, the legislation, administration. So I think this is a very complex issue. Now, how to incorporate and synergize with the GASEP? This, I think, we should continue to dip into uh, this problem and trying to find some effective practices among the jurisdictions here. I know among all of you, there are some jurisdictions which indicate that they have some effective practices in trying to detect, prevent the cyberspace from misuse by terrorists and their organizations. And by the way, some of the practices, practices, they may be effective, but they are not good. So we have to bear in mind the fundamental uh, freedom of the people who are using it, the increasing population who are using it, yes. the authorities and, of the airlines are using it, the upgrade of the machines. So I don't think it, it is now within the capacity of the audience here to answer that question, but I would like to express my appreciation to those who raised this question. This is the question we cannot avoid. Yes. Really, we cannot avoid it. It's a fact, and we need to deal with it in the most efficient manner. I, would, uh, I can see that uh, Captain Bartley wants to have a, an intervention on this. Yes, if you don't yes, mind. Please. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I think just because cybersecurity is also very near and dear to me. Um, just to add that. In what sense is? Oh, <laughs> well, I developed a workshop, we'll okay. talk about that. Um, but as it regards to a cybersecurity threat and the GASEP, um, the GASEP, the Global GASEP, did outline that one, as states, we do have to take into consideration emerging threats. Yeah. So cybersecurity is just one of several emerging threats that right. in the aviation sector we have to deal with. So we have to deal with insider threat, we have to deal with chemical. So. Um, as regards to our oversight or legislation, all those must be flexible enough to deal with mm -hmm. the emerging threat because the impact it has on the aviation, a cyber threat will have a similar, in, um, as it has a, with a bomb, it will financial cost, it will cost, um, systems will be stopped and we've seen that several, in several cases, but we need to have to ensure we have proper contingency plans and to ensure that those contingency plans, which will be part of your whole gossip and your security culture that you're supposed to be developing, would help to not eliminate, but rather mitigate against such a threat. So, so let's hope it. Thank you, Altia. Um, yeah, I, I can see this is, this is a real issue. And one of the other issues that I can see in cybersecurity is that we don't share enough information about cyber threats. We don't. Uh, sometimes we have the information and we don't, we don't pass it over because it's uh, somehow uh, related to national security. There is some national laws that forbids us to do so, but we need in the civil aviation sector to be more, more open to share sec cyber security information. This is very helpful to all of us. Uh, going back to the questions and because we are a democratic panel, I can see four likes on the first question. So I will pick this uh, first question with four likes. Uh, there is very, dif uh, there is, yeah, I can read very differences between all countries in aviation uh, security, and the GASIB has a huge activities in its roadmap. Could the GASIB roadmap adapted to each country? This is an interesting question. Who wants to go? Yeah, Mr. Gomez. Gracias, <coughs> Thank you. The roadmap was drawn up at a regional level, but for the global plan, in fact, it was the regions that took the global roadmap and made it into their regional roadmaps. And it is possible that some of the activities cannot be carried out because there's not enough capacity, not enough resources, and therefore they will have to be adapted. D yes, there are great differences, and there are great differences in capacity to implement. 
And there is also uh, the principle of no country left behind. Therefore, in the regions, we all really have to work together, which is what we are doing right now in CARSAM. We are trying to help those who can't uh, manage these tasks, and we have to be conscious of the differences. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. This is, this is absolutely correct, because I can tell you that as a regional director. I have some challenges in the region to implement a regional map as such. We need to go into the deep analysis, as Mr. Chen has said. Each state has its own specificities, has its own challenges, has its own differences. The setup are different in the states. The entities who are working on aviation security at the state's levels are different. They are not the same. So, yeah, we need at least to, 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 to implement or to achieve the ta regional targets, but we have to nationalize the roadmaps in order to prioritize with each state what are the priorities, what are the resources available, um, what are the gaps. This is very important that we analyze before we draw uh, a national uh, roadmap for the GASIP. Uh, it's correct, and I think, uh, you know, talking to our colleagues in Europe, some of the states in Europe start to do, start to draw a roadmap for its, their own state. It's a national roadmap that is coming from the regional GASIP. It will meet the same targets, but at least it has its own uh, uh, way of implementing uh, the, the, the roadmap. Uh, now, if we go back to the second polling questions, we are far from the 100 mark, but you can see clearly that 67% of us think that the human resources is an issue. Human resources with all the consequences. Human resources with their culture, with the security cultures. Human resources with their funding as well. So uh, sometimes uh, in the civil aviation authorities there is a lack of expertise because there is no funds to hire some new expertise in the civil aviation authority. So the human resources is the backbone of any oversight activity that we might have in our states. And it, it is really the biggest challenge uh, all over the globe. Uh, I think uh, I will pick one of the questions from the floor again. Uh, there is another question with, yeah, with one like. We, we, I have the questions with zero like. It's the more unf unfortunate, but we will pick it to make it fortunate. We have a gossip now, but we don't. Uh, but we, uh, what, but do we also need a global aviation facilitation plan? And I, again, I will give the floor to Mr. Gomez because he was the one raising the coordination. Do we need a facilitation plan as well, a global facilitation plan? Yes. Gracias, señor. Thank you. It is possible that in future, the implementation of security measures and compliance to Annex 17 plus uh, evolving threats will lead to a situation where there will need to be more and more security measures taken at a higher level. If the security measures are advanced, then there must be a facilitation plan in place at a global level in order to find a balance, in order to make life easier for the passengers. So in the future, ICAO must make a decision uh, regarding uh, its uh, facili a possible facilitation plan in the framework of audits, uh, for instance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. There is a question uh, saying Mahanet. that. Mm. Yeah. Who's, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Chertok. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to add, as an answer to this question, this is a topic that we have discussed at the regional working group on aviation security for the Yurnat region of ICAO, enav -Sec g As you know, there are 56 states that belong to that region. And the idea of a global plan being advanced is a very uh, interesting, but also uh, not an easy issue. We put together, for instance, a working paper for the uh, high-level conference regarding the need to harmonize or to have an information exchange 
between such working groups on aviation security, which are preparing plans and initiating that process in the regional bureau, uh, regional offices. So we have developed this plan in uh, the Yurnat region. It has been approved, and I assume that uh, a similar thing has happened in other regions. The problem is that we don't have contacts. We don't really know what the other actors are doing. And so we would like to ask the ICAO secretary to take on this mission. That is to organize the interaction between working groups and regional offices in order to advance a, a regional plan. This is so important. It's also worthwhile understanding what the approaches are in the different regions. So I would like to express my gratitude here to our regional office, which has been so active and has been working on so I, I don't know if uh, Carnell and Inga are here. They are the uh, regional officers, and they are so active, and we support them in that. We need to have this kind of space where we can exchange positions, both on implementing and on advancing and improving the regional plans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chertok. Um, yeah, the interregional coordination is really important. When we start developing the regional roadmap for the AFI and the mid regions, we have worked all the three offices in Cairo, Dakar, and Nairobi to develop the regional roadmap and develop the action plan of the roadmap. Uh, it's very important that we 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 don't confuse states with different uh, types of work. So the interregional coordination is something that is we are looking for at ICAO, and we are happy. Even uh, the uh, the aviation security officers of Euronet were in Cairo just last week for the interregional seminar on aviation security. So re interregional coordination is very important. Uh, I will go back to the interesting question, saying that oh my God, the moderator wants to change the uh, the gossip. <laughs> And, and by the way, the gossip itself, it says that it's, it's a, uh, the roadmap itself is a, is, a live, is, a li is a lively document and it can be changed if we need to. But uh, I need uh, also to open our minds to that different points of views are not wrong at all. Even conflict is not bad. Sometimes conflict is the root of a change. And we are in a very vibrant industry and we cannot live with one document forever. So what I want to say is that I'm not changing the gossip as now, but I need input from you how to make it better in the future. Uh, maybe we could have a better version that would suit you, especially on the implementation level. Uh, at this point, we still have like 10 minutes. If you don't have any pressing questions, I can uh, conclude by uh, thanking you for the interaction. Even the second polling questions now we are at uh, at. 84, so thank you for the interaction. And uh, before we leave, I want to thank our distinguished panelists for the great input, the great discussions, and thank you for the interaction. Uh, because aviation security is, is the duty of all of us, all of us who work in the realm of aviation security, uh, we have dedicated our careers to make the uh, aviation system more robust, more safe, and more secure. Uh, again, it's uh, we need to know we need to know what are the challenges we need to know what things that needs to be changed we need to know what other people are thinking about to counteract what we are doing to make aviation security the safest industry in the world uh, ladies and gentlemen before i conclude i need to give a round of applause to our panelists <laughs> and another round of applause to you for the interaction thank you very much and I will not forget to thank the interpreters for the job well done. This is a multilingual panel, which is not an easy thing. So thank you very much, interpreters, and see you very soon. Thank you very much. And now to you, Dini. Thank you so much. You're very well done. Thank you very, very much, Mohammed. I think he deserves a very good hand of applause as well. I especially liked the way you dealt with the panel with humor and candidness. 
And it's a bit ironic that as we were discussing cyber threat, we got the test by the Quebec government of their mobile system. So I would say that's another C, or borrowing from the Cs. How did we coordinate that? <laughs> Very good. We've made good time, thanks to Mohammed and the panel. It's 20 after 3. I suggest that we meet back here at 5 to 4, because the next session is one hour compressed, and we would like to really finish at 5 o'clock for our interpreters. They would finish at 5 as well. So enjoy the coffee. This is the final networking opportunity of the symposium. Make good advantage of it, and let's all be back at 5 to 4. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>